We would like to thank you for joining us for another episode of Looking to Jesus. My name is John Hines, preach for the Church of Christ here in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm joined by Daniel Sanders. Hello, oh, I Daniel. You're going to fill it in for me for the rest. Daniel of Sanders it. preaches for the church in Batesville, Arkansas, the Quail Valley Congregation in Batesville, Arkansas. Hello, Daniel. Pardon me for stealing your thunder right out of it's the all gate. All right, it's all right. You, you come up with different ways every other week to try to do something like this. You know, a couple of weeks ago, it was like I was like a surprise, a surprise guest on the show. All of a sudden, variety <laughs> is the spice of life. <laughs> All right. So what are we talking about today, Daniel? Uh, church organization. You know, we've we've started touching base with some different things within, uh, you know, what, what happened with church. Like last week, we were talking about communion. We were talking about the Lord's Supper. We were talking about some of the things that not only in the world, but even within the church, some of the difficulties, something that is so plain and something that, that should be easily understood gets so taken out of context. And I think that same principle uh, lies within the church organization. It it seems like it's so plain, so simple. We've been using some verses like 1 Corinthians 12, talking about some of the different things that were involved within the church uh, at the time when Paul was writing these letters. And now as we look, we see there are still some things that are are used within the church organization. and But yet some people say, is there a church organization? Or we don't go to the full accompaniment of the church organization. People have come up with different ideas and concepts of what to use to uh, fulfill or fill in for church organization. But the Bible is pretty plain and pretty clear on these different things. And we can look at Ephesians 4, spend a little bit of time there probably in our lesson today and looking at the church organization and what offices or what work or what, uh, I hate using the word titles, but there are certain titles that people have, certain titles of work that are specified within the church that are still used today. So let's start in Ephesians 4. You want to just start there yeah. just, as a, just to get the ball rolling? Sure. So this is Ephesians chapter 4. And it speaks about the household of God. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the household of God. And it says in verse 20 that this household, that it has been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay, where are you at? You said Ephesians 4. Oh, verse pardon 20. me. I'm actually in Ephesians 2. I'm in Ephesians chapter 2. That was verse 20 I just read. Okay. The household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Just to make the point, Jesus said, I will build my church, right? That, that's what he said. I will build my church. It is his church. He is the head of the church. That's also in Ephesians. That's Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23 that speaks to that. He is the cornerstone. We also know he said to the apostle, right? You will be endued with power. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. So that verse in Ephesians talks about the foundation of the apostle. So that's where the organization begins, correct? Yeah, yeah. the church organization begins with Jesus, established by Jesus. You know, he built, he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Speaking to one of his apostles, speaking to Peter, I'm going to build my church at the gates, gates of Haiti should not prevail against it. He, you know, as we look in Matthew 28, all power, all authority has been given to he give me on heaven and on earth. Go therefore make disciples of all the nations. Again, when we look at this, he is the cornerstone. He is the beginning point that bears all things. And, you know, we go back, if you're there in Ephesians, go back to chapter 1. You mentioned it just a moment ago, verse 22 and 23 says, Jesus is the head. When we say something is the head, that means he is the top. Of right. the church. He is the one that is in charge. He is in control. He has got the authority of the church. And that is present even to this day. Some people will say, well, what about what about these other things? What does that leave for, for us as individuals? It leaves nothing. We're the body. We're the yeah. body in subjection to the head. We've talked about this in previous lessons about looking to Jesus. And Jesus is the head of the church at the top of it all. And then everything kind of else is supposed to fall in place. Now, let, let, let's pause for a second. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. In denominations, how are denominations organized, typically? Well, I'm asking you. <laughs> well, okay. Well, you talk about kind of... Uh, let, let's... Let, okay, let me... They, have, they, have, they may have some sort, some limited authority, but they answer, there's someone always that they answer above, and it may not be within the local... Describe Catholicism, the, the Catholicism, oh. the Catholic hierarchy. So you have the Pope. 
going to be at the top. The Pope is is the head of the church. They, they will claim it's Jesus, but when, when it comes to matters of who they look to the answers for, they go to the Pope, and it changes from time period to time period. Then we have right. our cardinals. you got your bishops. You've got your priests. Okay, so you have... I mean, kind of the quick hierarchy of different things within the Catholic Church. So There's you have this... Bishop, cardinals, or Pope, Cardinal, Bishop, Priest. And the Pope is would be the, the universal bishop. So he's over yes. the whole kit and caboodle, right? He's over the whole... some people that will be over different areas. Right. Whether, whether you could say continents... Then within right. those you know, within those ones, then you have another person that would be over uh, certain areas of a continent, and then you know, it, it just it continues to break down. Right. Where again, we call it a pyramid scheme. Or a pyramid? Scheme. Yeah. And so you have, pyramid. you know, like I said, continent or country, and then maybe states, and then city. You know, like like that yeah. situation there you go to another denomination for example like the the baptist denomination and you'll have you'll have the same same sort of ideas you'll have a a world headquarters you'll have a national headquarters you'll have state headquarters you'll have right and it keeps breaking down areas within the state until and and you have that hierarchical arrangement you see that within Pretty much all denominations, even those who claim not to be denominational, very often they're arranged the same way. Like, for example, the Southern Baptists are arranged like that. Um, and so, one, the question I have is: Do you do you see that in the church? That that's the question. We've already established Jesus is the head of the church, the foundation of the apostles. Let, let Let's quickly make this point, Daniel. Can someone still be an apostle today? No. And why is that? Uh, one of the things is is that an apostle was one that was an eyewitness of Jesus resurrected. Okay, so no one's seen that today, obviously. Right. Um, and that's Acts chapter 1 and 2, where you can read about that prerequisite or that, that requirement to be an apostle. And so, and frankly, just from the verse we read in Ephesians chapter 2, the foundation of the apostles. Once the foundation is done, the foundation's done. You don't need more foundation. You start building up. Yeah. You don't need to keep building out. You build up. You build on that foundation. Okay. So in thinking about, okay, now the organization of the church as we see in scripture. So you have Jesus, you have the apostles. Now, where do you want to go with it? You want to talk about autonomy? Yeah, let's let's hit up autonomy before we get further into the organization uh, of the of the church of the church within the within the local church because I think it's important to take note is that the church is to be autonomous, meaning their own local place. So you are at the North Ridgeville Church of Christ. I'm here at the Quail Valley Church of Christ. Are we both members of the Church of Christ of Christ Church? Yes, but. We don't answer to each other, or we, you know, you got that right. You got that <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> but your church, you, where you attend that, where you're a member of, you are local within yourself. Even we'll talk, if you don't, yeah, we'll talk even, about elders here in a second. But you have yeah. elders there in there in Batesville, right? We have elders here in North Ridgeville. And you have a couple of verses in your notes. One of them, and we'll just mention these briefly. I want to actually look in First Peter chapter five. But you make the point concerning church autonomy. You mentioned Revelation two and three. Explain yeah. that one briefly. I want to uh, pointing out Revelation two and three. There are seven churches. They are all they're all different things going on within each church. And what Jesus does is that he speaks to each church individually. Right. Some of those churches were faithful. Some of them were faithful. Some of them weren't. Two right. of them were. Two of them were to be found faithful. We're, we're, uh, talking about Smyrna and uh, uh, Philadelphia. The right. other five were not being faithful. They yeah. were each being fa unfaithful in different ways. Right. And instead of just kind of generalizing everything together, Jesus pointed out: here's what's going on within your church. It's, what was going on there in Smyrna was not going on in the same thing going on in Ephesus, or what was right. going on in Laodicea was not happening in Thyatira. Each church was individual. Each church had their own issues, and Jesus was correcting each church individual. It's the same concept and same idea as what Paul writes, uh, for the most part. I grant it. 
his church to his letter to the church in Galatians was to the area of Galatians. There were multiple churches, right? But really, as we look at the other letters, he was writing to individual churches and being able to address whatever needed to be addressed. A lot of what we see being addressed was there in Corinth. What was happening in Corinth was not happening in Philippi or Colossae or Thessalonica. Each one was individual. And again, that that kind of speaks volumes as to how the churches operate. Yes, there are multiple churches, but we all are working individually at within our own local body, local area. One of the verses where we see that principle most clearly is 1 Peter chapter 5. Yeah. As verse 1, he says, and this is coming from Peter, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So Peter was both an apostle and an elder. Says, verse 2, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. That concept of shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. We'll talk about elders because that's a part of the organization of the church. Yeah. And we'll talk about it here in a second, but here to just see what elders are supposed to do, what they're called to do, and what they are limited how they are limited in their work is you shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. And I want I want to point something out because you know we look and I'm not and I'm not disagreeing, but you have Peter's writing to several different churches here, and he's doing that with the authority of an apostle, and he's doing that with the authority of an apostle. Now, this is where I want to use Acts chapter twenty, verse twenty eight and twenty nine, because Paul is speaking something, speaks it, but he's speaking directly to one church. I'm not saying, again, I'm not it says the same thing. Just to be able to reiterate, not only just a multiple church, but one church. He says in verse 28 of Acts 20, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. Right. Speaking to the Ephesian elders. Right. Not sparing the flock. So again, he speaks the same thing, but speaking to one church. Right. Just for the sake of argument, if someone said, well, he's writing to several churches there in, 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 in when Peter was speaking. Here's the same verbiage, the same words being said to just one. Shepherd the church among you. He called the Ephesian elders. He did not call the elders from Colossae. <laughs> exactly. It's again, like I'm not, I wasn't trying to... One trying to downplay anything because they're both speaking the same thing, yeah. but one of them speaks directly to just one specific group of elders. Yeah, and it's you shepherd the flock which is among you. Yes, and that make that makes so much sense. It's like what does someone who's a state away or a country away or halfway around the world? How are they supposed to shepherd a congregation that they're not even a part of? <laughs> and, and probably it's like don't it, even know, and probably don't even know anything about. Yeah, they don't even know their sheep. Yeah, right. G, you, you know the nature of being a shepherd. Jesus speaks that, and he says, "I know my sheep, and they know me." Right. That's just the nature of being a shepherd. And it's like you don't shepherd someone else's flock; you shepherd your own flock, and that speaks to church autonomy. Right. It's within within our own within the local congregation. With that's this is how it. It functions. This is how the church is organized. You have Jesus, you have the apostles, the foundation, and within the church, we have elders. Elders, deacons, we'll talk about here in a second. And you don't see what you see in denomination. You just don't, you don't see that in scripture. You don't see it in scripture. It's an unscriptural arrangement, how denominations right. are set up. You right. know, as far as, you know, denominations having a president, Having a board of a whatever. hierarchy of bishops, yeah, you got, you, got, you got elders, then you got the the supreme elders or hierarchy yeah. of a, an elder above an elder sort you, of thing. And you just you don't see that in scripture. That's not how the church is supposed to be organized. We have to stick to scripture. Otherwise, we're not respecting Jesus as the head of the church. So, right. churches have organization. There's a scriptural way for them to be organized. So, so let's get into it. So you have elders, and to your your earlier point, that doesn't one of the passages talk about whoever desires to be an elder 
how does it phrase it? He desires a good work. He desires a good work. Where is that passage? That's first. That one's First Timothy three one, uh, where it says, "If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work." And to the point, the position of a bishop, and it is an office. It is a work. Yeah. And so what we're talking about, we're talking about works. We're talking about roles, roles that are f- fulfilling that work. So you have elders, you have deacons, and you have perhaps we sh- we could include evangelists. Well, yeah, I would too, because I mean, you know, people will have a certain person doing the work. I mean, we're all supposed to be advanced, but they may have one that fulfills some of the role of just the preaching and teaching of the word. Okay. So uh, in a public setting. I mean, the, is a bishop supposed to be involved with that? Yes. Is a deacon supposed to be involved with that? I believe there is a little, there is, there's a concept of being able to serve in that capacity. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, so where you but, want, where you they, want to go with but, it? But, 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 uh, you know, there in Ephesians four <laughs> verse 11, again, you know, there's some that were, Paul said there were some that were going to be uh, serving as evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, Yeah. some servants, different servants. Right. Different uh, roles. All, different all these, roles. all these different things are so that the church will be at its fullest potential, fullest capability. That way, growth may happen, and the building up within that body will take place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's go to let's go to Titus next. I want to go to Titus if I can get over there. Where's Titus at? It's in the New Testament, right? I hope so. <laughs> We're in Titus, and Paul says he had left Titus. He says, this is Titus 1, verse 5. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. And then you have the qualifications, given verses 6 down through verse 9, and the qualifications need to be honored and respected, and people need to not try to find a way around the qualifications. Um, but here it is. It's like set in order the things that are lacking. If a church does not have elders, something's lacking. Yeah. And, um, yeah, well, that's the same thing that what Paul did, uh, he and Barnabas in Acts 14, 23, they were in local area. They were traveling around several churches and not only were they teaching and preaching, but they were also praying and appointing elders in every church. And what verse is that? Uh, Acts 14, verse 23. Okay. Uh, is, that, is that one of the earliest mentions of elders? I'm uh, trying to remember. Let's see. I'll, let me look it up real quick. Uh, That'd be pretty early. When it comes to the New Testament. Yeah. Uh, looking. Um, what's pertaining to the, to the, to the church. Yeah. It seems like one, it seems like there is. I, uh, there, I take that back. Uh, Acts 11. Acts 11, verse 30. Yeah. Yep. Is the, first the, other, mention, the other times are mentioned as elders, as in the, kind of the leadership of Israel. Yeah, but yeah. Acts, Acts eleven thirty, they the the elders had sent that had sent uh, the Barnabas. gift. Yeah. So so anyway, and so you you see the apostles, and there in your verse in Acts chapter fourteen, they were in Lystra, like, Iconium, and Antioch. Do what now? They were in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So they were in three different cities that were mentioned where Paul and Barnabas were at, where they had appointed cities or appointed elders. Yeah. So there they are. They're appointing elders. So let, let's, in thinking about elders, elders have a job to do. And this is where I'm going to start ranting, Daniel. Well, before you start <laughs> ranting, I don't know which way, you, I don't know which way you're going to rant. The idea I of, know, appointing, I don't know yet either. <laughs> I don't, yeah, there you go. Well, let, let me, let me talk first. All right. <laughs> so the idea of appointing elders, you know, within the church organization, when we're talking about within the church, the, the, the Lord's church, there's yeah. a need for elders. I yes. think looking at this, looking at, we have two verses that point out uh, the appointing of elders in every church, the, the desire to appoint elders. Paul told Titus in, your, in the Titus passage to appoint elders because the church was lacking if they didn't have elders. So what do we see today? Uh, you know, you and I have I've been at different places. We have preached at different places. We have uh, even uh, tried out at different places. And I don't know about you, but there was, there's been some times where, you know, the question of elders has come up, uh, the place where I've been, where they didn't have elders. And have you ever heard the response of, well, we don't have elders, but we get along. That's good enough. Yeah. Uh, so there's this, uh, there's this fallacy of, well, we don't, we, we don't have elders because we get along. Now, if the situation is, hey, we don't have qualified people, 
That's one thing. Get some qual- work on getting people that are qualified. If there, if there, if that was a situation, but just to be able to say, well, we don't need, we don't need elders because we get along because we don't need that, that, that guidance because, uh, well, for some, it may be the fact that, um, I may not, my, my voice may not be heard as much as I would like it to be heard or whatever it may be. Uh, that's not the situation. Jesus, again, we go back. Jesus has the authority, the elders, yeah. as we look at this, the elders work is to work under the guidance of Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. They are carrying out Jesus's command. He They're is not the establishing shepherd. their own. Yeah, he's a chief shepherd. They are not establishing their own authority with this. So right. this whole idea of, of well, I, I need, I don't want elders because I may not be able to. My opinion may not be heard. The Lord is supposed to be followed regardless. The Lord's will and commands are supposed to be followed through, and He is. If we are saying He is the head of the church then we are respecting his authority. And, and let me say this, you know, we read from 1 Peter chapter 5. Yeah. The very next verse where we left off Yeah. to, uh, to answer the person uh, who says, well, I, I want my voice to be heard. 1 Peter 5 verse 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The person who says, well, I need to hear, I want, I want people to hear my voice. You need to submit to your brethren. Yeah. You, you need to learn to have a spirit of submission. Right. And I it, think that's I mean, one reason a lot of congregations don't have elders because they're not interested in submitting to anybody. Right. And that, and that, that's, that's key. That is, that is key as, as I'll put myself in there. I'm a younger person. I am supposed to be in submission to my brethren as long as we are following God's will. Yeah. If there, if there's a point of, of now we're talking a whole different can of worms is if they're not being faithful to God, then I need to be able to speak up and let someone right. know about it. that's a whole different issue of thing. Uh, but to use this as an idea of, well, I can't have elders because I, I want my voice to be heard. Humility. Submission. Yeah. Submission and we, we also need submission to Christ. Yeah. It's and not a matter of just you mentioned submission to church. No, we're talking about submission to Christ. In as much as you've done it to the church. In as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. And it's like, are we going to submit to one another or is it we got it? We have to have our way. James says that wisdom is demonic. The wisdom that, you know, we're supposed to be pure, first, first pure, then peaceable, willing to yield. If we're not willing to yield, uh, we're we're following the devil. We're not following the Lord. One of the things I wanted to mention, Daniel, and it's not really the the point of this conversation, but some of the qualifications to be an elder: a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Can a can a woman be an elder? No, no, a woman cannot be a pastor. So all those denominations out there that have women pastors, uh, that's not what Scripture says. That's not organization. Now I've said that to say this: men need to men need to man up (laughs) that's what men need to do and we touched on that in our study about women teachers and things like that yeah and i made the point then i think the reason that happens a lot of times is because men are not the sort of men that god wants them to be and so when congregations do not have elders the reason is a lot of time is because the men are not the men that god wants them to be it's like they need to they need to be godly and what that's going to start looking like that's going to start looking like the qualifications to be an elder so when congregations like well we don't have it we don't have anyone that's qualified that's a problem <laughs> that that's a big problem because you look at those qualifications and we should all be aspiring to those qualifications blameless talk about our marriages temperate sober minded good behavior hospitable able to teach not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetousness, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. If there's something that, if we're not fitting that, then we need to, uh, we better recognize that lack in our own lives, right? Well. So, okay. So let, let, let me ask a question. Okay, so I just... Right, back, back to your rant now. That's the qualification. So now let me ask, and let's see how I want to, how I want to tackle this. You, you know, we've already read the verse from Titus. I left you in Crete to set in order the things that are lacking. You mentioned churches that do not have elders. Do you remember in the feeding of the 5,000, the way that whole account begins is the Jesus looks at the multitude 
and they are like sheep not having a shepherd, right? That's what it says. Yeah. They're like sheep not having a shepherd. So let me ask you to describe what are sheep like when they don't have a shepherd? How would you describe them? Wondering. They're what? Wondering. Okay, wandering. They have no, <laughs> and it's like they're, I mean, there's no rhyme or reason. They're, there's chaos. Yeah. E everyone's doing their own thing, right? Yeah. Um, also, you know, sheep, sheep have to be sheared. They have to be kept clean without a shepherd who, who shears the sheep. I, I don't know if you are, or if, if you're listening, if you've ever seen a picture of every once in a while, a sheep will wander off away from the flock and they'll find it months or years later. And it doesn't even look like a sheep anymore. It has so much wool on it. It's filthy. Right. It's so filthy. Right. And it's just an, an amazing sight. What are we like without a shepherd? And it's like, this is this is what happens. It's like you, and what it speaks to is an elders, a pastor. We're talking about the same person. We're talking about bishop, and we'll, we'll have to clarify this. We're talking about a bishop. We're talking about a pastor. We're talking about an elder. We're talking about the same person with all of those things. And so when we think about the work that has to be done, and it needs to be done, so let, let's let's deal with something real quick, Daniel. Okay. Um, there's different words for the same person. And so pastor, what does pastor mean? It means shepherd, right? Yeah. Bishop, I believe bishop is the one that's overseer. No, oh, bishop. There is the use of bishop and overseer both. Yeah. yeah. There's, so some I, there's some similarities between both. Yes. And so you have this idea of oversight. Then you have elder. How How do you want to describe elder? I guess just, I mean, it kind of speaks for itself. It's someone who's mature. I was going to say experienced. Yeah. Mature and experienced. Yeah. Okay. So talk to me about, all right, what's an elder's job? They desire a good work. So talk to me about, okay, so what's the job? Well, that would that, that would bring up our uh, John 21 passage. Okay. Uh, John 21, verse 15 down to verse 17. So there, Jesus, he, Jesus speaking to Peter. And again, Peter, what's he eventually known as? Well, we see him. He is also, not only is he apostle, but he's an elder. And so here's Jesus speaking to Peter. It says uh, there at the breakfast. When they eat breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16, it says, he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my sheep. In those three different verses there, John, as we're looking at this, he speaks to Jesus, or Jesus speaks to Peter. You got some work to do. You got, you got some work, to, some focus that you need to take care of. Uh, you love Jesus? Yes, Lord, I love you. Well, then you need to take care of my flock. You need to take care of my, my disciples. You need to take care of the local church, even. You know, looking at it and breaking it down, Peter takes this charge in being able to take care of the sheep. Not only do we see about the feeding of the young sheep, the young Christians, young followers of Christ, but then tending to them, maintaining the teaching and edification, building up, and then the feeding of everything, of the Word of God and everything. There are so many different things of looking out for the spiritual uh, condition, the spiritual uh uh, the spirit of each individual, looking at each individual soul and caring for them to, to keep them safe, to protect them as Jesus is protecting us, to do what is necessary, whether it is chast uh, chastening, whether it is exhorting, whether it is rebuking, whether it is any, you think about any of the different things that one has to do to help protect and take care of the sheep, it's all necessary. All those things are necessary in looking out for the local group of Christians within the congregation one is a part of. You know, there, there's so many things in that passage in John, and there, there are things that are lost on us in the English language. Yeah. And you really have to look at the words. And the, the typical one is the word love, where people talk about the Lord keeps using the word agape, and Peter keeps using the phileo. 
Yeah. But there are uh, there are other differences as well. For example, um, in your version for verse 16, is it 10 my sheep? I'm using New King James. Yes, it's 10 my sheep. And this is where the and the reason the New King James does that is because it's a different word than verse 15. The the King James uses the word feed throughout. The King James gives the word feed three times. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. But that first word for feed is just the word for pasture. It's feed my lambs. And that so that's the other difference. It goes from lambs to sheep to sheep. Yeah. And so the first one is just let them eat. Let them eat. Feed them. But the second word is, it's a different word. And that's why the New King James King James translates it as tend. And it's like, you have to tend the sheep. And I always think of Psalm 23, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Yeah. There, there's a reason a shepherd has a shepherd's hook. And there's a reason, and that's the staff, there's a reason a shepherd has a rod. And that's to protect the sheep from outsiders right? Wolves, <laughs> ravenous wolves coming in amongst the flock. But that's also if the sheep are are misbehaving, the shepherd can discipline the sheep. Yes. And that speaks to what you were just saying. It's like there is work to do. And what, what were all yours, whether it is feeding them, what's one of the qualifications to be an elder? Apt to teach. That's one of the qualifications. They are to be apt to teach. Now, again, an elder can be a preacher, but an elder doesn't have to be a preacher, a dedicated right. preacher, an evangelist. They can be, but they don't have to be. There's verses that show that clearly. But they do need to be feeding the flock. <laughs> That's what they they need to be doing. And so feed the flock and tending. That verse in Titus goes on when he says, I left you in Crete to set, in thing, set things in order that are lacking. He goes and he talks about how certain false teachers, they needed to have their mouths shut. Yes. And it's and like there's that, there's that tending and there's that feeding of everything yeah. and sure taking care of, of, you know, making sure that the proper food is being fed to the lambs and to the sheep. I, I know of a congregation, you know, some congregations, they will let anyone into their pulpit and it doesn't matter what they believe. And yet they think some of them, they think that's a good thing. That's not a good thing. You don't invite the wolves in amongst the flock. You don't let a wolf get up there in the pulpit. And if anybody should know that, and if any if anybody should know that, it better be the shepherds. You don't invite wolves in and you don't give them a platform. But, so, well, you know, we just want to be nice and give them a chance. No, <laughs> you, if you give a wolf. You're giving the wolf the buffet platter. Here it is. That's the dumbest thing in the world. Yeah. That's letting a fox into the hen house because the fox says he's going to behave himself. Are you, are you dumb? <laughs> That's dumb. You don't do that. And shepherds need to have the discernment to realize you do not do that. Shepherds have a job. When sheep are misbehaving, shepherds need to deal with it. Right. If Christians are being unfaithful and, and this, this, is oh, what does it, Good, good night alive. What does it mean to be unfaithful? Oh, to not be following God, <laughs> to not be following the Lord. And if someone's being unfaithful, I, I have seen congregations before where people don't even come to church for months, if not years, and yet no one, the shepherds don't do anything. And it's like, why are we not disciplining them? Why are we not disciplining the sheep? We want these people to be faithful. We want them to be disciples. And that requires the chastening rod of the Lord. This is what, sh this is what shepherds are supposed to do. That right. you have a shepherd's hook for a reason. The hook that is on the end of the staff is to grab that sheep's leg to keep it from running away. And instead, we let them go. We let them go until they're gone for years. And then we decide, oh, oh I guess we need to withdraw from them 10 years after the fact. That's... That's not shepherding, and that's the sad thing. This is not for today's topic, but church discipline. If church discipline just becomes a matter of paperwork, that ain't, that ain't right. Yeah. That ain't right, and that doesn't help anybody. Okay, so now concerning, okay, so, so again, what is a shepherd's job? Talk about feeding, talk about tending, um, 
what else could we we talk about as far as a shepherd's job? Oversight. Talk about oversight. How they they oversee the work. They they, they make sure that God's word is being carried out or God's will is being carried out. That yeah. kind of falls. I mean, we're 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 we're. It's not that we're repeating ourselves, but you know, there's a lot of tendencies within the oversight of what we just talked about with the correction with the exhorting with the building up making sure that god's word is being carried out in all these things and doing it in a proper order doing it in proper what'd you say proper order prop thank you pardon me my no, kids came no, home a minute ago so i'm no it's doing it doing it in a proper order uh, yeah. you know we, we've talked about that in recent weeks within our within some of our lessons that uh things need to be done orderly yeah and and the elders are making sure that the oversight of everything that everything is being done orderly. God's word is being obeyed and followed, not only as a church but even within the individuals. So that means there's a little bit of a personal involvement with reaching out to our reaching out to the local membership. Uh, there's a there's a book. Uh, the title of the book is it's they smell like sheep. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard of that before. I have not. I do know uh, sheep smell though. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, but it, it's a book uh, someone's recommended to me. I have it in my library. I haven't, I haven't read it in t- all of it, but the idea of it is, is that when an elder is involved with something, they're going to smell. They're going to be in, that. What it is is that they're involved. Yeah, they know. So it shouldn't be a surprise when if if you know with, with if one of our elders came up to one of our local members here and they they it's not it's not a surprise of hey how you doing they kind of know what's already going on right. You know, they they, 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 they they have some sort of idea. It's not like a big surprise. Like, well, why are you talking to me all of a sudden today? Yeah. You know, the elders are involved. So there is, there's some sort of resemblance of their personal involvement within our lives. The shepherd knows the sheep. Yeah. And, and if they don't what, know the sheep, then they're, they should not be, they should not be shepherds. Yeah. Just that simple. But there, there is a danger when it comes to that. And that's spoken about in first Peter chapter five and all these things, there's a danger. And it's Ephesians chapter five at verse three, because what elders are called to do is they are called to, what did I say? You said you, you threw a first Peter and then you said Ephesians. Sorry. First Peter five, three, (laughs) sorry. Brain spasm. (laughs) I try to do it again. First Peter five, three, nor as being Lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And so that's another work of elders. They are to be examples to the flock. If they're not doing that, something's wrong. So that's why some of those qualifications come back into play at that point. Um, yeah. So being examples to the flock. But the danger is you don't lord it over the flock. Yes, right. you have oversight. And yes, you have your role to play. But you do not lord it over the flock. Let me ask you, what would that look like? And I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot there. What would it look like if elders lorded over, lorded their however you want to put it, lorded their authority. How, how, what does that look like? Lording it over the flock. Okay. Uh, easy comparison is we're now we're, instead of going to, to describing an elder, we're more describing a manager. Okay. Uh, and think about, it, I've, I've worked, I've worked in retail uh, over the years. And what it is, is that you begin to have people that are just, it's a, it's to look at me. It's a pride issue. It's look at me. I've got power. You don't. It's diatrophies, it, wanting the preeminence. Yeah, and then taking it to a taking it to a different level of things. Of I've got power, you don't. You have to listen to me, or else. Yeah, you know. So that's what we start seeing. We're seeing more of a managerial role of everything rather than a shepherd. Do, do, are, are there some similarities with some things? I think there are, but a manager kind of tends to have that. Every time I've been in working in retail, and I've worked in uh, different facilities over the years, uh, they all. Oh, every one of them at some point it's i've got power you listen to me or else and that's not how an elder is supposed to operate the elder is under yes they have oversight but they're still in subjection to christ just like i am yeah i'm making myself some notes so i don't forget pardon me daniel no you're fine but rather that's than, how, that, that's rather how than that's looking how at, look at it. go ahead go ahead that's how that's how i look at it uh, of it taking more of a more of a managerial style or supervisor role because sometimes when people get that power when someone gets promoted they want to be able to I want you to know that I have power I'm going to show that I have power and you're going to have to be subjective to my power and that's not what it is 
that's it's nowhere close to what it should i've seen that before and then so then that that power kind of fills one's head you know they don't have power and then they go and take it into other measures and kind of forget about their role of tending the sheep feeding the lambs feeding the rather than looking at it as a manager and i'm not disagreeing with you i, I want to also look at it as a dictatorship there you go um and i just like i said just making some notes how do dictators behave? Well, they'll say, you got to do it just because I said it. Yeah. And it's like, show it to me in scripture. And it's this is how this is how shepherds are supposed to operate. They're serving the chief shepherd. So it's not it's not, well, just because I said it. It's like, no, show me in scripture. Because yeah. if you're not going to speak as the oracles of God, we got a problem. That's right. that's but that's what this is what dictators do. Do they'll say, Well, just do it because I told you to do it. No, that's not how this works. Secondly, sometimes, so so that first one, just because I said it, that deals with their communication. But then sometimes they don't communicate, yeah. you know, and that's also what dictators to do. They keep a lot of things secret. Right. <laughs> and we're not talking about discretion. We're talking about a lack of communication. You know, think about Hitler in World War II, and there were, there were Germans who had no idea what he was doing. And it's like, well, why is that? It's intentional. They want to keep things on the down low because if everybody found out what they were doing, there might be an uprising. Right. And so they like to keep things. There's not, sometimes there's not much communication. That's sometimes what lords do. It's like, oh, well, the, the laity do not need to know what we're doing. No, that's not right. That's not right. Third thing, dictators are abusive. And so there are parables about those who, you know, the servant who started beating his fellow servants. And you start thinking about how shepherds can be abusive. Right. And that can happen. They can abuse their fellow elders. They can abuse the deacons. They can abuse the preacher. They can ab abuse anyone in the congregation. And um, I've seen it myself where they abuse the preacher. And they try to tell the preacher what to preach, how to preach, when to preach, and everything else. Um, and it starts becoming an abusive relationship. Yeah. Another ex another part of lording it over the flock, I would suggest, would be overstepping bounds. And what I mean by that is, okay, what is what what is the what are the elders' purview? What's their domain? It is spiritual matters. It is it, that's what it is. It's spiritual matters. Um, I know of a congregation not too far from you, <laughs> where they worked it into the preacher's contract that the preacher starts attending their children's softball games. Uh, that's not in your purview, <laughs> sir. <laughs> and, and see, and, and that's what sometimes elders do. They want to micromanage every facet of people's lives. No, you need to be interested in the spiritual things. Yeah. Right, the spiritual things in a person's life. That's what you need to be interested in. So as far so beyond that, unless there's sin involved, if there's sin involved with some other facet, it's like, okay, then it becomes a spiritual matter. I understand that. But sometimes elders want to get involved with things that they should not be involved with, and that's what lording it over the flock starts looking like. Yeah. And they start trying to micromanage everything. It's like, nope, that's not your purview. I told you I was going to rant, so here it is. That's part of the rant. <laughs> because what that starts speaking to is, okay, a church needs to have elders. They need to have elders that do their job. But then there's also deacons. And you're in a situation where you guys, you have elders, right? Correct. Do you have deacons? Not right now. We're in the same situation. We have elders, but we do not have deacons. Now we've already so we've looked at elders' jobs. Elders' jobs are are to be feed my feed my sheep, tend my sheep, spiritual matters. Yes. What are deacons' jobs? What's it what's the purpose of a deacon? To serve, to serve the local body in different in, in, in it may not it may not always be spiritual matters, but also addressing physical matters and needs as well. Would you would you say Acts chapter six is the first place where we sort of see deacons work? Yes, I, I have taken that that stance on those verses. When, that even though it doesn't say that it's the deacons that are selected there, 
the idea, the thought behind it was, was that they were selected to serve. And that's what we learn about a deacon is that they are servants. They are there to serve in some sort of capacity. And in this, there was a specific need for them to serve and to address the the Grecian widows. And I, I will say, I was just looking, I was curious, while it does not specifically call them um, deacons in Acts chapter 6, the apostles say it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Yeah. That word for serve there is the word for deacon. Yeah. And so that this is the work that they were being called to do. They needed people to serve. All right. So um, let, let me read Acts. You, you, Daniel, you read it for us. I've probably okay. been speaking too much. Read Acts 6, whatever portion you want to. Yep. So reading, uh, I'm going to read the first four verses. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve, and as we're talking about this, the twelve are the twelve apostles here at this, summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve table. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves entirely to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And we'll reverse just the first part of verse five. The saying pleased the whole mall. And then we see a selected set. Yep. So so you so you look here at this, and yes, uh they were addressing a need. There was a need that the uh, the the Grecian widows were not getting food. They were being neglected because of all the things that had been going on. There's a great multitude of Christians there. There was also some. There was also you know, some people were not able to get food because uh, again, you know, look the the situation was is that these were widows. They didn't have their husbands to be able to help provide for them, or even maybe children to be able to help provide for them. So. Here, the apostles, they recognize a situation. They recognize that there is a need to be addressed. And what do they do? They speak, first of all, and say, here is a reason why we're getting ready to do this. We have focus. Jesus gave those individuals the understanding, you need to preach and teach things for saying to the word of God. Was this work less important? No. It was still needed to make sure that the physical needs of the individual was being maintained. But but the first primary focus is, is that we should preach the word of God, that we need to give our time and attention to that. So because of that, we need to pick out some individuals, people that had were followers, fellow disciples. It wasn't some just sort of newbie in some sort of way or not even a Christian. It was pick out people that were of good reputation that they may be able to serve in this capacity. That way we can be able to do our job of preaching the word and maintaining the word and being able to do that while these other issues, these other concerns are still being addressed and not just tabled and brushed off. I believe it's James chapter two that speaks about the things needed for the body. Yeah. And it's like, these were needs that needed to be seen to. Yeah. But it was, now, now let, let me ask you, if if nobody stepped up, what would the apostles, would the apostles have let these widows starve? No, I don't think they would have. I think they would have done whatever they could. So, but, in, okay, so then if they have to serve tables, what is that going to take them away from? It's going to take them away from the word. And it's going to take away from their from their primary duty and focus. Now, like I said, there's a different ways with it, but. No, and, and what I'm wanting people to see is, it's like you have roles and if you don't have people to fulfill those roles, things start breaking very quickly. Yeah. But you know what I don't get in, in Acts chapter six, I don't understand why why these deacons, why these servants were chosen, because I thought that was the preacher's work to take care of the widows anyway. I thought that was the preacher's work. It's Christian's work. <laughs> and what I'm what I'm speaking to is, and you and I both know. And it's like you you go someplace and you talk to them about the work there. And it's like, what do you expect a preacher to do? And it's like, well, a, a preacher, you know, it's the preacher who it's the preacher who needs to visit all the all the individuals. When you if you look in scripture, it's like, and I'm not saying that people should not visit. We're all called to do that, but right. we're talking about specific work. And when these deacons were first chosen, and this is where I really 
people think deacons work. You go to congregations anymore. And like I said, we don't have we don't have deacons. We got a whole nother set of problems. But I've been places where there are deacons. And it's like, well, it's the deacons who mow the grass. It's the deacons who do the duty roster. It's the deacons who keep up the website. It's the deacons who clean the building. It's And it's like when it first started, it was the deacons who were taking care of the physical needs of the brethren. Now, a lot of places, deacons are no more than the janitors at the church building. Yeah, And it's like, that's not what the deacons were originally supposed to be doing. Now, as you can tell, I get kind of irritated about that. <laughs> but now it's like, okay, so what happens if you don't have deacons? Well, the apostles aren't going to let those widows starve. So now the apostles are going to have to neglect their work. And now in the grand scheme of things, obviously we don't, we still have apostles. They've just gone on to their reward, frankly, for 2000 years. But anyway, okay, you have elders and you don't have deacons and I'll, I'll just get myself in hot water. Feel free to jump in if you want to. What I see happening a lot of times is elders will start doing deacons jobs. And they'll start, frankly, being janitors of the church building. And it's like, that's not the elders' work. That's not what the elders are supposed to be doing. The elders are supposed to be interested in spiritual things and focusing on spiritual things, on feeding and tending the flock. They're not supposed to be doing deacons' works. Yeah, They're neglecting their duties, or at least it can easily lead into neglecting their duties. It's like, no, this is not how it's supposed to be. So what ends up happening is they start neglecting their duties. And lo and behold, guess what the sheep, what guess what starts happening to the sheep? They may be being fed literally, and they're not being fed spiritually. They may be having their physical needs seen to, and spiritually, they may be dead as a doornail. And um, I've seen it happen. <laughs> yeah. I've seen it happen. When elders start doing menial tasks, and I don't mean that in an insulting way, it's like elders have a job to do, and that is work that needs to be done. So so let me say this, because this whole thing started, we're talking about church organization, and it's real easy to point the finger at denominations and say, oh, you guys aren't organized right. You're unscriptural. Yeah. When we need to take, we need to pause and examine our own congregations and say, are we doing things as the Lord wants us to do them? Right. Are we organized the way the Lord wants us to be? Or is there something lacking that we need to be working on? And um, you can probably guess where I fall on that. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll say this also, Daniel. We're in a situation, elders, no deacons. Um, and I'm not saying it has to be this way, but pretty often. And let me, let me, let's look back over at Titus. Mm, okay. Titus, or is it Timothy? Uh Timothy. Timothy, you have the qualifications to be a bishop, an elder, but then you also have the qualifications to be a deacon. Likewise, deacons must, this is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, but let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. And then it speaks about their wives. Deacons are to be tested. Elders are to be tested. And very often, I'm not saying it has to be this way, very often individuals are deacons before they are elders. Yeah. Well, guess no, what? It doesn't, it, it, it's, and that's, and then you, br you bring that up. It's, you know, some people are just under the persuasion that you have to be a deacon before you can serve as an elder. That's not the prerequisite. Right. It's right. not that way. I mean, does that happen a lot? Yes, it does. But that doesn't mean that that is the standard always. If there's yeah. someone that is qualified to right. be an elder, uh, that may, oh, I've never served as a deacon. That does not mean that they're disqualified. Right. It does not. Um, I think as as we mature, mature in the faith, th those individuals back in Acts chapter 6, they were faithful men, yeah. right? Choose from among yourselves men of good reputation. Now, they are being entrusted with certain physical affairs that the church needed. Um, but but here, here's my point. If we are not training up the next generation, well, then guess what happens in the next generation? If you have elders and no deacons, and it's like, and it's like all of a sudden you may have a whole generation of men that are not qualified to be an elder. So, guess what you get in another 20 years? You get nothing of, of 
No elders or no deacons. You get no elders and no deacons, and you probably have a preacher. And then it starts looking a whole lot like a Baptist church and a single pastoral, a single pastor system, even though the preacher is not a pastor. That's not what I'm right. saying. But I've been in places without elders. I've been in places with no elders and no deacons. And guess how they look at the preacher? The preacher does everything. And that is not right. Yeah. That's not right. Um, I think there's um I think there's a lot of there's a lot of issue in and, and like I said, I'm just speaking for myself. We got issues here in the congregation that I'm a member of. We got issues. Like we got elders and no deacons, and we we better take it seriously. Because to to something you said whenever it was like two and a half hours ago, <laughs> and you, you had people saying, Oh, well, no, we don't have elders and we don't have deacons, but we get along just fine. Um, there, there is another church that could have said something like that, and you referenced it in Revelation chapter three. Uh, in Revelation chapter three, as you had, they they got along. Revelation chapter three verses one through six. I mean, there there wasn't turmoil in the congregation. There wasn't. There weren't. There weren't. There weren't struggles in the congregation. They were dead. <laughs> they were dead as a doornail. Yeah. And when people say, "Oh well, we're at peace." You might be at peace as rigor mortis is set in. And it's like, you just don't care anymore. Right. You don't care that there's something lacking. That There's different ways to be at peace. There's good ways to be at peace, and there's bad ways to be at peace. As in, yeah. rest, rest in peace, and you're just dead. And um, when it comes to church organization, um, there is a need. There is a need for elders to do their job. There's a need for deacons to do their job, their God-given job. And there is right. a need for preachers to do their job. Um, we'll also add, there's a reason Paul tells Timothy, elders who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that all may fear. That's another element of a preacher's job. Um, along with 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 down through verse 16, about give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, right? All of, all of those things. It's like preachers have a role to play. and It's just, Daniel, it really upsets me. Because what what happens, and and I'll I'll throw you in the hot water now. <laughs> no, I won't throw you in the hot water. If elders start doing deacons' jobs, who is it who has to do the elders' jobs? And it's usually the That's preacher. Part of the preacher, yeah. So then the preacher's doing the elders' jobs. The elders are doing the deacons' jobs. The deacons are mowing the grass outside, and then people wonder why things aren't like they need to be. And it's because people aren't fulfilling their roles. I'm done with my rant. I think. <laughs> let, let, I mean, well, it, it does. It does show. It does show the importance of, that there is a church organization of everything. There is a a set order of everything. That's why, again, Paul wrote there in Ephesians four, verse eleven: some were chosen to be preachers or evangelists, some were chosen to be elders. There were some that chose to be prophets at that time. We've talked about that. Those things have yep. ceased. But there are things. I'm going to paraphrase it because we'll include it. It's. Uh, Paul point out to the churches today, there are some that are chosen to be preachers, elders, and deacons. Yeah. Uh, this is time to, be able to yeah. serve in the fullest capacity of everything yeah. so that the church may be able to function. The church may be edified and built up. That way all things are taken care of physically, spiritually, and we're all focused on working and building each other up towards heaven. This is Titus chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, and love and patience. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, and all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Every one of us finds ourselves in one of those four groups. We're either an older man, a younger man, or an older woman, or a younger woman, and we have a role to play in the kingdom, and we better fulfill that role. And if we expect someone else to do our job for us, that's when things start breaking, you know? And yeah. it's just that it's just that simple. Um, and it's, it's something that brethren need to take very, very seriously. It's real Absolutely. easy. It's real easy to look at the Catholic denomination and say, that's not organized right. It's and while there's something lacking at home. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. So 
He has, Jesus has built his body the way he wants it for a reason. And he tells us the reason there's work to do. Daniel, appreciate it. Yep. Appreciate it as well. Yep. I hope this study has been helpful for you. If you're listening, feel free to share it with others. Leave any comments you want to down below. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Hope you have a good week. Join us next week for another episode of Looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus.